with its extraordinary history department can help us begin to expand this narrative to and be more inclusive of Native Americans and the LGBTQ community and others as well. We also recommend in our book that we take a lesson from EMILY's List, uh, which has been an organization that has worked to elect Democratic women, that the conservation community needs to begin to promote uh, the election of people to public office that have core conservation values. That the days of going up and trying to convince somebody of the good of conservation, if they didn't go up there with those original values, is really kind of over. And we also challenge, uh, and there's a few of us in the room, the silverbacks of the conservation movement, hey. <laughs> myself included, um, that, that we need to facilitate uh, an intergenerational handoff of power uh, to the next generation because you're going to inherit all of these things uh, and this emerging uh, millennial generation will inherit all of these institutions and and we need to to help mentor to help transfer and steward that next generation into into leadership and I, I think you know you look at what's going on around the nation today the the survivors of the parkland sh very very tragic shootings are demonstrating once again that young people can can lead these kinds of movements and you know, we, we need to remember that you know, when John Lewis was mar marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and was attacked he, by the police, he was only 25 years old. So uh, that, that young people can, can do this again. And that probably at, at one of the most important points is the conservation community needs to expand its base. Uh, that it has been tr traditionally in, in, in a silo. And we need to expand it to historic preservation and to the business sustainability and to public health and to civil rights and to social and environmental justice and to science writ large, to all towards these sort of common causes. I'll give you a, one of my favorite examples is this sort of emerging field around the role that, that time spent in the outdoors does for our own health. Um, and that uh, CDC and others are beginning to recognize that there's a direct correlation between the availability of outdoor spaces and community health. And there are doctors today already starting to literally prescribe uh, the outdoors as part of their practice uh, for obesity or heart disease or depression. Um, that they literally say, go to this trail, hike it three times a week, you know, and, uh, and call me in the morning. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's really interesting to watch the, the industry rise. Uh, the outdoor retailers out there um, are sort of exercising their economic muscle. Uh, the outdoor retail show left Utah over conservation objections and moved to Colorado. Uh, and, um, and you start thinking about these opportunities for coalitions between the outdoor retail industry and the public health industry and the conservation community. You can really build a very, very strong uh, network as well. Um, uh, at one of my, on a recent conference, an uh, individual got up and said, the National Rifle Association has about four and a half million members. REI has six million members. Um, there's also a really fascinating growth area um, in businesses that want to have or to solve some of the world's environmental and social problems and also make market rate at the same time. Um, and, um, and it's really fascinating to watch them sort of grow and they're, they're about 7% of sort of the financial sector right now and that is really on, on the rise. So this is not the time for conservation to stay uh, in the silos of the past. Um, in my experience and Gary's and certainly my brother's, we've seen uh, the conservation community compete with each other over crumbs of appropriations or attention or media or membership or whatever you know and since we're in this extraordinary historic place let's remember ben franklin said you know we either hang together or we're going to hang separately and i think that's the that's the key to conservation right now another little segment of our book so we need to work together in terms of collaboration as these interests increasingly practice the skills of collaboration and gain experience in working closely together in a more common cause, they will find their collective voice to be more powerful, influential, and effective. There will be a time when the physician, the pastor, 
the park ranger, the business leader, the scientist, and the school teacher, all working together for conservation will not seem unusual, but expected. So this is a this is a perilous time, to be frank. But I, frankly, I am I'm kind of weary of the doom and gloom talks. I've I've been to a lot of those, and they're kind of depressing, uh, frankly. So our last chapter in here is uh, is called resilience. Um, and we return to this, this theme about strategic action and optimism. Um, because we see that there are, there are points and charts uh, through, these, uh, through these rough waters. And we also know that we have seen this, particularly at the local level, where sort of a unified conservation movement can have a, a long-term effect. One more little reading here. We have faith in and admiration for the, what the next generation of conservationists can and will accomplish. They inherit a world fraught with peril and a nation divided, but their inheritance also includes access to global knowledge, commitment to improving their communities, and self-awareness that they can and should empower themselves. Finally, we are optimistic because we have seen firsthand the restorative powers of nature. If provided the opportunity and sometimes assisted by human insight and skill, nature can recover and flourish. We have seen high meadows in the flanks of Mount Rainier, return from bare ground to an eruption of alpine flowers. We've seen the flows of water critical to what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas called the river of grass to be replenished in the Everglades of Florida. And salmon once again swim in the Elwha River from the sea to the mountains in the Pacific Northwest. We've seen community gardens bursting with vegetables in former vacant lots of Chicago and Baltimore. And the renewal of beaches and tropical forests in the island a Vieques in Puerto Rico that was once strafed, bombed, cratered, and littered with munitions. And it is not just nature that can flourish. So can our history, our sense of justice, and our respect for civil rights. So a unified conservation movement in my mind and in Gary's mind that remembers these values and acts in, with strategic intent um, is likely to be very, very successful. And we, we sort of ground those beliefs in this sort of core American value. So Gary and I are taking this book on the road um, <clears throat> with really trying to promote a, a dialogue around, um, around a new vision for conservation. And, and frankly, we, we chose to do it at universities. And Gary and I are doing, between the two of us, 18 universities across the country. Um, because the next generation is the place to make that investment. And so we're sounding an alarm, but at the same time, we're, we're providing our ideas for strategic action and some optimism, because frankly, we need that uh, as we go. I think the dialogue will be a little loud at times, a little raucous, but uh, that's, uh, that's what we need. And, uh, and we're greatly honored to be able to come back here to William & Mary and, uh, and start that dialogue. So let's start it with a few, uh, with a few questions. Thank you.